All right, good evening and welcome to Dome at Home, the Manitoba Museum's weekly astronomy show every Thursday night at 7 o'clock. I'm your host, Scott Young. Great to see you. I'm the planetarium astronomer down at the uh, planetarium at the Manitoba Museum. We're broadcasting here from Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And we have a lot of stuff to cover today. It's been quite a dramatic day in terms of uh, space stuff that was going on. We had a, a new module arriving at the International Space Station and all sorts of hijinks and uh, dramatic moments ensued. So we'll get into that in just a moment. We're also going to be covering Saturn, Lord of the Rings. It is at its best point of view. Oh, um, Michelle says she has no sound. Can anyone else hear? Let's just make sure that uh, you can hear me. Hopefully you can all hear me. So uh, please add into the chat. We're using a new chat software too. So I should be able to um, see the chat, not just from Facebook, but also from YouTube this week. Sorry for the folks out in, uh, in YouTube land that, uh, that weren't getting through last time. For some reason, those, the chat wasn't updating. But now it looks like, uh, looks like we're working. Okay, so we have a few things to, uh, to get through. We're going to jump right into uh, one of the big announcements that's, uh, that's really exciting for us, of course. The Manitoba Museum and the Planetarium reopens coming up in just a few days, August the 5th. Thursday, August the 5th, so next, uh, next week, basically. We will be open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The Planetarium will be running three shows a day, including a live sky show, a special family kids show kind of a program, and also a feature show. So you can check the website for details, manitobamuseum.ca. You can see the programs there. We'd love to see you down at the museum. I know they have some admission deals and all sorts of things going on to, uh, to encourage people to come down. The museum galleries are also open. And they will be um, uh, open upstairs. They've got the new Prairies Gallery, which is just fantastic. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a really a, a treat to check out. So we'd love to see you down at the at the Manitoba Museum and the Planetarium. Of course, the Science Gallery still remaining closed because we're not allowed to let you touch anything while you're there with, uh, with all the COVID stuff. And uh, if we took out all the things that you touch in the Science Gallery, it would be an empty room. So uh that's a really exciting thing coming up for us and we're very glad to finally be reopening uh oh michelle uh, the youtube link um manitoba museum if you just google manitoba museum or search for manitoba museum on youtube you should be able to find us there all right so um we are gonna take this show completely out of order and we're gonna jump right into uh, some cool or, or perhaps not so cool space stuff. So uh, we're gonna jump right into that. Cool space stuff. Today was supposed to be a big day for the, uh, the space program and it was the uh, Nauka Russian module, the first new Russian module to the space station in 14 years. Uh, launched about a week ago and it's been playing catch up over the last week catching up to the International Space Station and it was supposed to dock this morning uh, which it did. I actually got a chance to see the Nauka module flying by itself it looks like a, a star moving across the sky and uh, because we had that week of catch up we were actually able to to see it flying free before it joined up with the International Space Station. Now of course they're all uh, connected and so uh, you can you can just look for the space station sightings and that will uh, tell you when you can see it. There were some problems with this module though. It was originally supposed to launch in 2015 and uh, it sort of sat in storage for a number of years partly because uh, there were some funding problems the Russians couldn't afford to finish it and also because they, ran, they, they detected some problems and had to take the whole thing apart and rebuild parts of it and so on. The poor European um, uh, robot arm that was, was catching a ride on this was ready to go and unfortunately it was also delayed so the European Space Agency was really excited this thing was finally getting off the ground. It got into orbit and almost immediately they started having some problems. The engines were malfunctioning, the main engines that would actually let it catch up with the space station were not operating immediately. They got that trouble shot 
there was a problem with one of the rendezvous antennas. They got that figured out. The, the, the Russian mission controllers basically had their sort of their Apollo 13 type moments where they're all trying to solve the problems uh, as quickly as they come up. The last eight days, things were starting to look pretty decent. Docking started. And uh, normally when they dock these things together, I mean, the, the Nauka module, it's basically this gigantic chunk of hardware. It's about 20,000 kilograms. And even at, you know, a really slow speed, 20,000 kilograms crashing into you in the wrong spot can do a lot of damage. So they usually take this pretty slow. Well, Nauka was coming in just fast, really fast. So the automatic system wasn't slowing it down sort of as perhaps they thought it should. So the cosmonauts on board, there's a backup system. There's no one on board the Nauka module, but the cosmonauts that are watching on the space station, they have a remote control system that they can sort of take over manual control. They tried to do that and Nauka ignored them. So this thing is barreling towards the space station. It did actually slow down and it did actually come in for a totally successful uh, and safe docking. But there, you, you could hear the announcer, uh, Rob Navius at, uh, at NASA, is sort of like the color commentator for all the space uh, missions. And he was um, as agitated as I've ever heard him. I mean, he was obviously keeping it cool, keeping it together, but it was obviously a pretty stressful, uh, dramatic event, as they like to say. So this thing comes barreling in and comes into the space station. It finally, it docks properly and... Uh, Everybody's all excited and the thing is docked. They tighten all the screws so that it's nice and firmly attached. And then basically the coverage ends and uh, the cosmonauts go up there and they start, you know, they open one of the hatches and they start plugging in the wires so that the communications work and stuff like that. Because this is basically a new room for the space station and a, a new science lab. So they start hooking it up. All of a sudden, the engines on Nauka that have been malfunctioning and giving problems this whole time start firing uh, inadvertently and unexpectedly, as they put it, that's not supposed to happen. So basically the space station has this new piece on it that suddenly is starting to fire its rockets and it tilted the space station about 45 degrees out of its normal alignment. Obviously, the, the NASA folks and the, the Russian mission controllers and the astronauts on board, everybody started working together. The automatic systems started firing engines in the other direction to try and bring it back into into uh, position but uh, it was again another sort of dramatic moment here luckily the nauka engines ran out of fuel and so the tug of war between the new module and the and the old system sort of ended but it was pretty dramatic there this morning and leading up to around lunchtime our time and uh, at the the 4 30 press conference Everybody was like, yeah, the crew was never in danger. Everything was fine. We have systems for this. But uh, it's probably one of the most dramatic and, and scary events in the space station's history, certainly that I'm, that I'm aware of. It's right up there with the, uh, hey, there's a, there's a hole in the space station and air is leaking out scenario that we had a little while ago. Hopefully that is the end of the drama with Nauka. Hopefully now it will just become a wonderful space module uh, science lab and all of these cool things that uh, that it was designed for. I'm a little concerned still because you you never quite know when you when you had that many sort of problems with a spacecraft you you get a little bit nervous. But anyway, we'll be watching for that and uh, hopefully hopefully all the problems with uh, Nauka have come to an end. If you want to see it, go outside tonight because um, the space station will be going over southern Manitoba roughly. Actually, it's better view from uh, from Ontario and uh, and points east, but no matter where you are, uh, you'll probably get a view of it tonight, either around uh, 1030 central or uh, about 90 minutes later. You have to go online and, and do the um, predictions for your particular location. For Manitobans, this is a, a map of the whole sky with all the constellations. And uh, basically the space station comes up over the horizon about 1022, comes out of the west, and then rises up into the sort of southwestern part of the sky and then goes off towards the southeast. This is a bit of a confusing kind of map if you're not used to the full all sky map. So this is, this is a little bit better. If you're facing southwest, it's going to come from your right and move across the sky 
um, from right to left. So watch for that. If it's clear where you are, you should be able to see that from pretty well anywhere in southern Manitoba. And uh, folks, for folks farther north, you probably won't get as much of a good view because uh, it's just a, a little bit far south, this particular pass. Anyway, I'm going to be watching just to make sure it comes over the horizon at the right time. I, I mean, it, it was it was a rough day for the space station, folks. So it's it'll be nice to sort of uh, take a look at um, at seeing it and and uh, seeing that everything's all okay. Not that I can do anything from down here at the on the ground, but uh, certainly it is uh, it is um, nice to see it. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn up my volume just a little bit. Turn up the gain on my mic because uh, Randy's pointing out uh, his volume has to be cranked up. Yeah, we're trying to keep some of the noise down here, but uh, hopefully that's a little bit better for you. Okay, it's really nice, I got to say, to be able to see everybody's comments. We're now using, um, instead of using Zoom, which is our old system, I'm now going right to uh, a, a, a website called Restream, which basically has all these tools for, for doing Facebook and YouTube and all sorts of things at the same time. So. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to see more of the chat and uh, keep up with some more of the questions. As, uh, as you know, all summer, Mike has been away, so uh, my, my right-hand guy who basically makes all the stuff go on and, and takes care of the chats and things like that uh, is not with me right now. He's, uh, he's on a well-deserved vacation, so I'm flying solo, and uh, so be gentle with me in the, in the chats. All right, let's look at the sky. If you go out this evening, you're going to, first of all, probably see the effects of smoke. I don't, I don't know what it's like where you are, but uh, here in southern Manitoba, we are just full of smoke in the air. There's a there's a air quality statement out. I've been fighting a headache all, all day with all the smoke and things like that. I forecast a particularly nice red sunset because the smoke really makes the... Uh, it scatters away a lot of the... the the um, bluish light from the sun and so all you're left with is the red and the uh, and the orange and things like that so a nice colorful sunset once the sun goes down though it'll probably interfere a little bit with our view of the stars because when you've got this much stuff in the atmosphere it filters out some of that starlight some of the, some of the light from the stars has been traveling for dozens or hundreds of years through space and by the time it gets to us here on Earth, it's pretty faint and it doesn't take too much. A little bit of cloud, a little bit of um, smoke or haze or things like that to prevent it making it all the way down to the ground and uh, ending up inside our eyeballs. So we'll have to see what the transparency of the sky is like. But still definitely worth going out. We, uh, we have the planet Venus visible still right after sunset. If you go out just as it's starting to get dark, very low off in the west, you'll see Venus gets brighter as it gets lower. And so if you, uh, if you don't get out before about 10 o'clock, you'll probably start to miss it. It gets down really, really low very, very quickly. Once we get after 10 o'clock or so, let's see. Oh, uh, hey, James, how's it going? Nice to see you. Um, last night around 11, I could only pick out the brighter stars like Vega and Arcturus. Yeah, I was out last night as well. I was thinking I'd do a bit of observing and with the haze and the smoke, I mean, that scatters the twilight light as well, the, the residual light from the sun and just sort of brightens up the whole sky. So I've, no, I've noticed that I really couldn't see all that much till nearly midnight, really. So usually we get a better chance to see the, the stars a little bit earlier. But yeah, it's been pretty bad. Once we get to, you know, here we are getting to about 11 o'clock in the sky here. And I'm just going to bring us right to 11 o'clock because I like to be accurate here. There we go. Our western constellations, the springtime constellations, are uh, the ones that are still visible for us barely. We've got bright Arcturus over here in the west. Arcturus is part of the constellation of Boates the Herdsman. If you remember Boates, Boates is the one that looks like the ice cream cone. And a little bit farther to the north, we've got our Big Dipper with the curved or arced handle. You can remember the, the phrase, follow the arc to Arcturus. That's how you can tell that that's Arcturus. Arcturus is actually sort of a nice yellow-orange star. 
and uh, you might notice that color um, when you're looking at it, especially if you have binoculars. That'll make it uh, a little bit easier to, uh, to, to hear, to see, sorry. Sorry, I just saw Randy's comment there uh, about gain is everything for the microphone. Yeah, I cranked up the gain. Hopefully it's not too noisy here, but uh, okay. So um, we've got the, the springtime constellations are really getting low and, and hard to see. As we swing over towards the southern sky, we're getting into that um, wonderful summertime. We've got the, the, there we go. We've got the summer triangle high up nearly overhead. Here's bright Vega, the brightest star in the sky right now uh, that we'll be able to see. We've got the summer triangle here. And if you think of the summer triangle as, a, as an arrow and you sort of follow it down towards the horizon, well, just off to the left of there, we've got two other bright objects. These are the two planets that we've been talking about for months now. They've been visible in the morning sky. Finally, they're rising early enough that we can start to see them in, well, almost in the evening, you know, in the hour before midnight. Saturn over here and brighter Jupiter start to rise um, over in the southeast. I still can't see them from my backyard because the neighbor has too many trees to, uh, across the lane to the south. So I can just glimpse them through the, the gaps in the trees, but I haven't been able to get my telescope on them yet. So, uh, so I'm going to have to take a trip out of town, I think, so that I can get a clear horizon, because both Jupiter and Saturn are a real treat if you've got a telescope. We're going to be focusing on Saturn this week, because Saturn reaches an important point in its orbit around the Sun, a point that is called opposition. Opposition basically means that from our point of view here on the Earth, the Sun and Saturn are opposite each other in the sky. So as the Sun goes down in the west, Saturn will just be rising in the east. And then as it goes all the way around, Saturn will set in the west just as the Sun rises in the east the next morning. So when a planet is at opposition, it is at its, um, it's basically visible all night long. And so you've got the maximum number of hours to see it. It also turns out that it's usually pretty close to the point where it's also closest to the Earth in our, uh, in our orbit that time around. Here's a, here's a high-tech NASA diagram. It sort of shows, not to scale, but you know, the Sun's in the middle, the Earth orbiting around the Sun here, and then Saturn farther out. As Saturn moves along and as the Earth moves along, basically when, they're in, when Saturn's in opposition, that also means that the distance here is kind of at its minimum. If Saturn was still in this spot, but the Earth was, you know, on this part of its orbit, they would not be in opposition. And also the distance would be a greater distance. So near opposition, the planets is usually at its closest, which means it's at its biggest and its brightest, its best. It's not exactly on the date of opposition for a bunch of not all that interesting reasons, as, uh, as it turns out, but it's usually very, very close. So we'll just sort of estimate that, you know, near opposition, these planets are sort of at their best. Personally, I like to observe planets in the month or so after opposition, because that is when they're rising in the early evening. They're still kind of close to us, maybe a little bit farther away, but they're rising at a more convenient hour. And that's really going to help, especially now because it, it doesn't get dark till so late. You know, in September, Saturn's going to be rising 830, something like that and we'll be able to see it in a dark sky. So that's really going to be, for me at least, prime uh, planet observing time. Uh, let's see. Okay. We will be doing um, a couple more constellations when we come back. We'll definitely uh, get back to a, a few more of our constellations. But I, I sort of jumped over to Saturn here, and I want to carry through with our uh, sort of theme for the, for the week. This is what Saturn looks like through my telescope. Uh, this, is, this is actually... Uh, an image taken from a video. I had a video camera in the eyepiece of the telescope and I shot some images and then I took all of the individual frames of the video and in the computer I added them together and that sort of cancels out some of the noise because the thing is when you when you take a picture through a telescope of a planet it's often not as good as what your eye actually sees live. If you're looking through the telescope your eye and your brain is doing all of this sort of processing and adjusting and, and things like that. Whereas when you're looking at a picture, that's kind of it. So um, 
this gives a good sense of what kind of level of detail you can see on a good night when you're looking at Saturn. You can see the, the planet itself. There's a, a cloud band across there. The feature, of course, the rings. There's not just one ring. There's a whole bunch of rings. And they are, um, you know, on a good night, you can separate uh, the outer ring and then the inner ring. And there's a thin black gap in between them. Astronomers being wonderfully poetic folks have named these the A ring and the B ring. A is the outside one and B is the inside one. And actually there's the C ring, which is really, really faint. You can barely see it along the inside of the B ring there. Anyway, that's the view of Saturn through a telescope. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm surprised how well this turned out, to be honest. I, th this was one of my first attempts doing video astronomy. And all I did was I looked on YouTube and figured out a, a few tutorials and followed along. Uh, I got myself a $200 little camera that uh, basically just, it looks like a little eyepiece and it just plugs into the eyepiece of your, uh, of your telescope. And then you take video and dump the video into this program and it spits out, out these images. So anyway, very, very cool. As a, as a comparison, here's a shot of uh, Jupiter through the same telescope. And you can see Jupiter is quite physically larger, partly because it is physically larger, but also because it's closer to us. Saturn's twice as far away. So it's actually surprising how much detail we can see when Saturn is over a billion kilometers away from us. Now, the one thing that this image is not showing, this is an example of how the camera doesn't always give as good of a view as your eye, it's not showing any of Saturn's moons. Saturn has about five or six moons that you can see in an amateur-sized telescope, and they look like little dots that will appear sort of in um, a pattern sort of around the rings. And seeing the rings, uh, or seeing the moons, really gives Saturn a 3D quality, because you can sort of... Um, it, it just, you can tell that the whole thing is actually not just this flat thing, but it's a, a globe with a ring around it being viewed at an angle, and the ring, the, the moons are in that same angle. Really, really compelling. Jupiter has a few moons as well, but Jupiter tends to be a lot more edge-on to us like this. So the moons go back and forth, left and right, and they move across the front, but the, we never get that same tilt that Saturn has. Saturn really has a dramatic tilt. And, uh, and that makes all the difference when, when viewing it. This is not shot through my telescope, uh, as you can tell. It is uh, taken by the Cassini space, space probe. Cassini is one of the hardest working spacecraft of the 20th century uh, and into the 21st century. It did a, some amazing work at Saturn. It was in orbit for a number of years and took so many images that are just spectacular. And here you really get a sense of what Saturn is like. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about Saturn, what it is, and what, you know, why it looks the way it does. Saturn is what we call a gas giant planet. So that means it's made out of gas, like hydrogen and helium. And giant meaning it is much bigger than the Earth. So to, to compare the scale here, um, the Earth would be just a little bit bigger than the mouse pointer compared to, Jup uh, compared to um, Saturn here. The rings, you can start to see that it's not just the A ring and the B ring, but there are thousands of rings nestled in between, in, uh, inside each other. There's a whole bunch of different gaps. And the rings actually cast a shadow on the surface of, or on the clouds of Saturn as well. And the planet Saturn casts a shadow on the rings. So there's all of this shadow play going on, depending on what the angle is between the sun and the planet, and whether it's tilted this way towards you or you're seeing it edge on or so on. So Saturn, even though it, you can always see the rings in a telescope, it looks different every year. And uh, there's a lot of really, um, that sort of keeps it fresh. I could look at Saturn every night for the rest of my life and still never get tired of it. The other thing that we mentioned, of course, is the number of moons that Saturn has. There are five or six visible in a small telescope. Saturn actually has 82 moons. Some of them are so small you can't see them without being in a spacecraft right there. But there's a whole bunch of them that, again, they most of them orbit in the same plane as the rings. 
here you can see one where uh, there's the moon and there's the moon's shadow right there cast up on there. So the sun must be sort of down off the bottom of this, uh, this image. This is an old image. This is uh, from Voyager 2 in 1986, back when basically there weren't digital cameras, there were TV cameras that uh, sent their images back. They still got some surprisingly good images. So here's, you know, here's 1986 and here's, uh, here's the, uh, I think this was about 2011, this particular image. So I'm pretty impressed with what Voyager was able to do back in the day. As Saturn goes around the sun in its 29 and a half year journey around the sun, we get to see it at different tilt angles. Just like the Earth is tilted over, um, Saturn is tilted over. And so right now we're getting a view kind of like this one. The rings are not quite fully open, but, but nice, and, uh, nice and tilted. I do remember the last time when Saturn's rings were basically right edge on a few years ago. And so it looked kind of like Saturn had lost its rings. The rings are so thin that you can hardly see them when you're looking at them edge on. They're, let's see if I remember the numbers, they're about 150,000 kilometers across, but they're, they're a few tens of meters thick. Not kilometers, meters. So that's thinner than a piece of paper is compared to its size. I mean, the, the rings are exceedingly thin and they're not solid. They're made of, well, basically snowflakes. The whole system of rings is nothing more than billions and billions of little pieces of uh, snowflakes and some larger chunks of ice and things like that held in a gravitational dance going around Saturn. Why Saturn's rings exist are one of the big mysteries of planetary science, because the way gravity works, things tend to fall in towards the center. Planets shouldn't have rings for very, very long. If there was some kind of, you know, say two moons of Saturn crashed into each other and broke apart and all of that material spread out to make the rings. Well, that material should only be there for a few thousand years or 10,000 years or so before it all spirals in towards the center and disappears. So are we seeing Saturn at a, just a coincidental time that, you know, just before we invented telescopes, um, or a few thousand years, you know, sometime in, in human history, Saturn didn't have rings and then two moons hit each other and, and created this? Or is there something else going on that is sort of feeding the rings and, and keeping things in position? Well, we do know, and, and someone asked here that, um, let's see, where did it go? Uh, oh, Mike is asking, uh, do the moons ever touch Saturn's rings? There are moons inside the rings. They're called shepherd moons. And basically they go around and their gravity gives things a little push one way or the other, and it keeps the rings all sort of in order. So it does seem like there's a really complicated system of, of gravity going on with all the moons and the ring particles, but um, still not fully understood. So that's kind of a, a neat thing. This is one of my favorite images. This is taken from behind Saturn. And so we're looking towards the sun, except Saturn is eclipsing the sun. Now the sun is actually far enough away that the sun is much smaller than Saturn. So we don't see the sun at all. All we see is the sunlight glinting off of the outer atmosphere of Saturn and some of the rings that are invisible, except when they're backlit. And then right over here, I think it is a tiny little blue dot. That's us. That's the earth as seen from Saturn. It just shows up as a single pixel um, just on the edge of this, this ring here. But it gives you a sense of, of um, well, perspective, really. Everything, all the problems that you have, all the issues that you're facing, every bill you have to pay, every person that cut you off in traffic, all lives on that little pixel. And here we are seeing the whole universe around it. That's one of the reasons that I like astronomy. You get out and you start thinking about these big questions and the fact that you got cut off in traffic this morning or that you have a bill to pay, that's, that fades into the background. It's very relaxing to get out and do this kind of stuff, whether you're thinking about it or whether you're observing from your backyard. Um, you know, it's, it's a visual sport, it's a mental sport, but uh, it's also a, a, just a great way to unwind. Okay, I could probably spend about three hours talking about Saturn because there literally is so much 
to, to get into, but we're going to hit a couple of the highlights of the moon system. These are two of the moons of Saturn. Um, these are the two largest moons, actually. The, the one in the background there, they just happened to be lined up when the spacecraft was flying by. It was able to snap a picture as the two of them were lined up. The one in the background is Titan. It is uh, the only moon in the solar system that has a substantial atmosphere. And in fact, you can see the clouds all the way along the edge here. You can see that the, it's, it's fuzzy. There's, there's uh, an atmosphere there. And then in front, this is Rhea, which is Saturn's second largest moon. And it's just a rock, lots of craters, um, more what we think of when we, when we see moons in the solar system. I mean, if you looked at, at, at Titan and you didn't know that it went around Saturn, you would probably think it's a planet. It's big enough to be a planet almost. It's got a complicated atmosphere. I mean, it's, it's a pretty significant world. However, definition states that if you orbit around a planet, then you're a moon. Doesn't matter how big you are, doesn't matter how cool you are, you're a moon. That's the way it is. So Titan, one of the most interesting moons in our solar system. The Cassini space probe took some great pictures of Titan. Uh, on the left is sort of the visual view, but if you use an infrared camera, you can actually see through the clouds. And the center picture is basically showing what the surface of Titan looks like through the, through the clouds. And then the right-hand side is kind of, a, um, kind of a composite, just to make it not black and white looking. But uh, those dark spots, we think those are lakes. Lakes of liquid methane, uh, natural gas, basically. Lakes of natural gas on Titan. They also dropped a, a little probe into the atmosphere of Titan. It was called the Huygens Space Probe, and it was just basically a, a tin can with a parachute and a, a camera and some sensors and things like that. And they dropped it into Titan, and it uh, took all sorts of great pictures and, and um, sort of confirmed the idea that there are lakes of, of uh, liquid on the surface of Titan. The, the air pressure of the air is great enough that even way out there, even at low temperatures, the, uh, the liquid in the lakes actually stays liquid. It doesn't boil away into space or things like that. So again, a very, very complicated and interesting system. Most of the rest of Saturn's moons, they kind of pale in comparison to Titan. You got a lot of ones that are rocky like this with craters. There are a number of them that are made out of ice. This is, uh, this is uh, Dion, and uh, this one's awesome because it looks like the Death Star. There's a massive impact crater here, uh, any bigger, and this probably would have split the whole moon in half. And I mean, that's, that's kind of maybe a hint to why Saturn has rings around it. If you've got this many moons and this many impacts happening, it kind of makes sense that you get a lot of, you know, pieces of ice and rock and stuff pulverized and spread out around the area. So maybe there is uh, some idea that the, the rings of Saturn are being replenished. I'm not sure. Anyway, totally looks like the Death Star. This is another interesting moon. This is uh, Iapetus. Iapetus is a icy moon. It's got a big crater on it. And that, uh, that dark stuff is not like missing data or something like that. One side of it is dark and one side of it is light. As it goes around Saturn, basically stuff collects on the front. It's kind of like when you're, when you're driving down the highway and you get bugs on your windshield. I doubt that all of this brown stuff on Iapetus is actually bugs, space bugs or anything like that, but it's obviously picking up some kind of material. Um, let's see. Uh, Michelle is uh, saying Enceladus is much more interesting than Rhea. It's your favorite one in the solar system. It is a pretty cool moon. I mean, with the, with the change of, uh, of color like this, you can even notice it in a backyard telescope. When Iapetus is on one side of Saturn, it is like, I think, about four times brighter than when it's on the other side. Because one, one side you're looking at the bright side, and one side you're looking at the dark side. And it's, it's, it's immediately obvious if, you, if you're able to watch it as it goes around Saturn. Um, let's see. Um, Melissa is asking about, uh, can you comment on how Saturn flattens itself out into an oblate spheroid and the rotational speed? Ah, complicated questions. Let's get to another Saturn, question, uh, another, uh, Saturn picture back here. So when things spin, you've kind of got a balance between gravity that's trying to pull things into the middle and then 
kind of the centrifugal force of as things spin, they kind of want to move outwards. You know, if you if you take a a ball on a string and you swing it around, the string pulls in to keep it from flying away, but its motion wants to make it go away. And so there's this sort of balance point. And when a moon or a planet or whatever is made out of rock, well, it doesn't really change much. But when it's made out of gas, like Saturn, the, th the whole thing spins around the, the equator of the planet, the, the region sort of around the, around the middle, starts to bulge out a little bit and the, the top and the bottom sort of flatten out. So instead of being nice and round, you wind up with kind of this oval or as Melissa was saying in her comment, an oblate spheroid. Jupiter is actually the one that is the most distorted because it's so big that um, the motion is, is even more exaggerated as it goes around and it's rotating a little bit faster than Saturn. And so Jupiter is noticeably squished at the poles and bulged out at the equator. Even when you look at it in a telescope, you can notice that it's not perfectly round. Now Saturn, it's less of, a, of an effect, but you might be able to notice it in this image here, or actually let's just go back to, to one of these. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. The rings really complicate the, the thing. As soon as you put the rings there, your eye starts to um, do all sorts of crazy things. But basically the equator is bulged out a few thousand kilometers um, more than the, the poles. So it's squished out. And actually one of the other co cool things about Saturn, this is, this is something I learned in my grade three class, I think it was. If you were to take Saturn and stick it into a pool of water, it would float because it's actually made of gases and it's so, well, its density is so low that it would actually float on top of the water like a, like a marshmallow in hot chocolate. So another thing, that's, it's the only planet that would float if you could find a big enough jar, uh, glass of hot chocolate for it. I think that's unlikely to be tested anytime soon, but still kind of a neat thought experiment. Okay, let's see. We've got, uh, oh, we've got uh, Pascal is saying, uh, our Star Wars loving four-year-old is so excited about the Death Star moon. I know it is definitely, uh, I mean, you see that picture and I just can't, you know, that's no moon, it's a space station. You can't not think that, right, if you're a Star Wars fan. Um, I just wanted to check back here. Uh, I saw a couple of questions that went by. Let's see. Oh, no, okay, we, we got those questions. Okay, so Saturn is at its opposition point on the night of August 1st to 2nd. So a couple of nights from now, don't worry about going out on that specific night because quite frankly, the difference between that night and a couple of weeks on either side, it's not going to change a huge amount. I mean, it'll change its distance by several tens of thousands of kilometers, but that's such a small fraction of the distance to Saturn that for you and me, it's not even going to be noticeable. I mean, this is less of an effect than the supermoon, which you, if you've watched the show before, you know that I have ranted about the, the non-superness of a supermoon. It's such a small amount that, that people don't notice. Well, the Saturn's opposition effect, the same thing. You've got a month on either side to, to pretty much get the, sa the, the best view of Saturn. And so for us, that means, you know, into September, that's when we'll start to maybe notice that it's getting a little bit fainter and a little bit smaller in the telescope. But even then, it's still going to give some really good views all the way through the fall. So this August, we're going to go out. We're going to do some Saturn stuff. Um, we had talked about doing a, a Saturn event uh, with the telescope. We're going to wait a little bit, partly so that it'll rise a little bit earlier in the evening and partly because we expect that as August continues, um, the restrictions on outdoor events will decrease even further and we actually be, be able to do a live with people under the sky kind of event rather than just a virtual event. So watch for that. If you, uh, if you haven't already, visit the Manitoba Museum's webpage and subscribe to the e-news uh, newsletter or you can join, uh, you know, follow us on Facebook and, uh, and YouTube and you'll get the, the updates there. Okay, we're going to pop back to the sky for just a moment here, and then we'll try and answer a few questions before we, before we wrap up for the night. 
Coming back to our su our uh, summer triangle, we had a question. I think it, oh, it might have been Melissa and Rowan um, asking about Aquila. So the summer triangle, a uh, a milestone of the summer sky, the brightest star in the triangle. Here's the big triangle. It looks like a, a slice of pizza. The brightest star is uh, Vega, and that's in the constellation of Lyra the Harp. This, is, this little parallelogram here of stars is supposed to be a harp. The faintest of the three stars is the other top one over here. This is Deneb, and it's in Cygnus the Swan. And so here's um, the swan's body and long neck down to its beak. And then here are the wings stretching out on either side. Eh, okay, I'll give you that one. Maybe that's a swan. And then down at the bottom is the middle brightness star. Uh, that is the star Altair, and it is in the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. I'll zoom in just a little bit here. Aquila, to me, looks like a stingray. It's like a, or a manta ray or something like that. It's just sort of um, wide wings on either side and then a long tail with a tiny little stinger at the end here. You can always tell uh, the, the star Altair because it's got a star on either side of it that shows up pretty easily. These two bright ones are actually pretty easy to see with your unaided eye and they're nice and close so it it, it, it jumps right out. So that should help you identify that one. It's supposed to be an eagle and in fact some of the pictures even show that it's an eagle carrying some godling or another from Greek mythology. Again, for me, doesn't look like that. But it is the, the summer triangle is a great milestone. Now, if you're using binoculars, there's a couple of little constellations around the summer triangle that I want to draw your attention to that are pretty cool to see. Um, one of them is just right inside the triangle. You got the triangle here, and then just above Aquila, there's this tiny little group of stars. There's a little line with a couple of stars at the end here. Here, we'll just zoom in. Oops, wrong button. We'll just zoom in and, and look at them by themselves. This is a constellation called Sagitta, and Sagitta means the arrow. And okay, it kind of looks like an arrow. There's, it, it's, it's a line with feathers at the end, sure. Um, so Sagitta is a nice little constellation. Your binoculars will basically fit most of it in the field of view, if you've got uh, sort of regular binoculars. If you've got the higher powered ones, maybe you'll only get about half of it in, this, in the uh, view. But still, it's a nice area to scan. It's right in the middle of the Milky Way. So there's all sorts of little star clusters and, and little nice groups of stars and Milky Way uh, background and stuff like that to look at. So that's one nice little, little constellation. And then sort of down the other way, there's this kind of little squished rectangle with a tail here. This is Delphinus, which is the constellation of the dolphin. And it's another nice small one, fits in your binoculars. Lots of uh, star clusters and, and little groups of stars all surrounding it. Um, okay, sure, it's a dolphin. Um, I like dolphins, so I, I learned Delphinus very early. I don't know why someone's shooting an arrow at the dolphin, but it looks like they're going to miss, so that's good. Those are that whole area between Sagitta and uh, Delphinus and then into Aquila is right in the Milky Way. There's all sorts of great stuff to look at in there. So again, just sweep around with your binoculars, see how many stars you can find. Uh, a good, a good um, test of your eyesight and uh, practice for, for seeing faint stars is to get your logbook out or just a piece of paper or whatever and draw a picture of Sagitta and then add all the stars that you can see to see how many of them there are sort of in that region. Now this is a this is an exercise that can get out of hand. You can't plot all the stars in the sky oh, or can you? There's a challenge. But um, certainly when you're when you're drawing things it really makes you sort of concentrate on what's there. Focus on um, what you can actually see. There's I don't know if it's the pressure of someone else might see your drawing or if it's just because you're you're trying to plot things accurately that you're, you, you just pay a little bit more attention. But it really helps train your eyes to see faint stars. And that will pay off. The more you do that, the better your brain will be at interpreting these faint images and the more you'll be able to see, whether you're using your unaided eye or binoculars or a telescope or, or whatever. So, um, Jasmina asks, um, 
is there only a summer triangle or is there a triangle for every season? Well, you know, there's certainly a triangle in every season because all you need are three stars and you can make a triangle. But the summer triangle is really made of bright stars and really stands out. It's really the best. Now in the fall, there's a square, the square of Pegasus. And in the winter, there's actually a hexagon of bright stars. Spring is the one that is doesn't really have its own sort of geometric shape that really jumps out. But um, yeah, the summer triangle really is uh, a, a summer thing. We'll be able to see it straight into the fall though. So you'll be able to see it in the sky, even though it's not the, the season that it's named after. All right, we have time for just a couple of questions here. So if anybody does have a question, um, oh, uh, sorry, uh, Ben was uh, Ben on YouTube is saying, let's have a look at that uh, hexagon polar region. There was an image right at the end of the Saturn thing that I that I kind of skipped over. Um, there we go. So the great thing about a spaceship is that it doesn't just look at one view. It goes around a planet and sometimes it gets up above it and you can see down. This is the North Pole of Saturn and surrounding the North Pole. Oh, I guess I should turn on the picture for you. Surrounding the North Pole of Saturn, which is right in the center of the of the little circle on each of these pictures here, there's a series of storms that swirls around, and then there's more storms out here. But for some reason, the way that those clouds and wind patterns interact, it sort of forms this vortex that is not round like a like a tornado or a hurricane here on Earth, but it's hexagon shaped. There are mathematicians and theoretical physicists that are going bonkers trying to come up with exactly what's going on here to explain how you get a hexagon out of basically things that are circling around. It must be a very, very complicated system. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we could never see from Earth. We can never see this level of, of detail and we can never see up onto the top of Saturn, even with the tilt of its... Uh, of its axis. You never get a good enough view to have discovered this. So this is an example of the kinds of things that are discovered only when we send a spacecraft out there. And uh, like I say, it's one of the many mysteries that still exist out there around Saturn. All right. Uh, let's see. Do we have a... Yeah, it's a Stargate. Yeah, that's right. It looks like a Stargate. Um, okay, let me see. Um, looks like actually we've covered off most of the questions so if you're a fast typist you can get something in real quick now and you might be able to uh to get a question answered um while we're uh while we're here uh, just a reminder we are opening up and uh, we would love to have you come and visit us um as you may know the the museum is a, a charitable organization we're not you know part of the government or anything like that and so basically we get grants we fundraise and we sell tickets that's how we pay the bills so if you want to come and see us buy a ticket and uh, help pay my salary I would very much appreciate that um, and of course the museum does all sorts of wonderful things that don't involve me so uh, very very worthwhile cause let's see it looks yeah there's yeah there's George I did have a new picture of George and I forgot to swap it in so I'll have to uh, I'll have to do that for next week I shot uh, he was outside with me when I was trying to uh, get the, get the telescope drive working and uh, I, for those of you that have been watching the show my telescope drive has died and I'm waiting for a replacement I was trying to jury rig something and he was outside with me on the leash and so he was rubbing up against the tripod legs and and uh, I got some cute pictures. Anyway, I'll put that in for next time. For those of you that haven't been watching the show, um, George is the star of the show. When George makes a live appearance, which is fairly rare, but when he does, we get more comments and reviews from that episode than we do for anything that I say. So uh, we, we, we bring George out basically to help, uh, help encourage people to watch the show. So, all right. Um, Thank you all. Oh, um, Ben is just pointing out that uh, we got free admission to the Vancouver Science Center with our Manitoba Museum membership. So there's this great organization called the Canadian Association of Science Centers. And it's basically all of the science centers and planetariums across the country. And we have this program where if you're a member at one of them, you basically get free admission to all the other ones except the ones in your home province. Because there's kind of like a 
uh, not a competition, but I mean, if you if you could be a member of the planetarium and also the uh, children's museum and the zoo and uh, the aviation museum, all for just one price, all of us would go broke. So it's a great deal if you do any traveling at all and uh, gets you into all the, the museums in Ottawa and all, across the country. So that's one of the many benefits of being a member at the Manitoba Museum. Yeah, lots of reciprocal benefits. Um, some places offer other things like um, gift shop discounts and things like that. Our, sh our museum shop closed back during the COVID thing and uh, we're not quite sure when that's going to reopen or what's going to happen. I know they're, they're looking at it, sort of not my area, but uh, right now our shop is not open. But uh, there are other benefits like that as well. And of course, when you're a member, you get uh, newsletters and you get free admission to all of our planetarium shows and the museum and invited to special things. And so it's a, it's a great group. Thank you all for visiting for hanging out with us. Thank you for uh, keeping the chat uh, active. It was it was uh, really good that I had this new app here because uh, I really wouldn't have been able to keep up with everything otherwise. So I'm quite happy with that. Oh, one more one more uh, question. Uh, Melissa just snuck one in here on uh, on um, Facebook. What are my favorite observatories? Well, so I've only been to a handful of professional observatories. My favorite one of all is the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Victoria, BC. It is a wonderful facility. They've got a, a little science center there called the Center of the Universe. Sorry, Toronto, but uh, that's in, in Victoria. It's a wonderful place. I got a chance to, uh, to drive around one of the telescopes one night when I was there for uh, another event, and it was one of those amazing nights I'll always remember. Um, the Dominion, um, sorry, the uh, David Dunlop Observatory in Toronto is another great one. I haven't uh, haven't had a chance to be the, to go there myself, but uh, I know that it's run by the local astronomy club right now. They do all sorts of public events, so that's a great one. And uh, I've been down in Fort Davis, Texas. Uh, McDonald Observatory is a great spot as well. They've also got a, they've got a, a planetarium, but it's just seats outside, and they have someone that does planetarium shows with the real sky because they're in the middle of nowhere up at a, on a mountain in the desert and they can do that sort of thing. Probably wouldn't work as well in Winnipeg, um, at least in the winter, but it's a nice thought. Um, oh, and uh, Boris. Hey, good to see you, Boris. Um, where's the best place to watch the skies within an hour or so? You know, the best place is if you happen to own property somewhere because then you have total control over it and so on. Most of us don't have that option. Um, I like Birds Hill Park. It's far enough out of the city that it gives a decent view, and yet it's close enough to be relatively convenient. Uh, La Barrier Park's another good one if you're heading south instead of north. Um, Beaudry Park is a little bit more rustic on the, on the west end. There isn't as much sort of facility there. It's just kind of a big open field kind of thing, but uh, also a reasonable spot. But really, if you can, as long as you're, as long as you're off the highway, and you're not right next to a town, you probably get decent views. Take one of the service roads and just make sure you're on, you know, public property or a road or something like that. But make sure you're not, I mean, if you're going to turn off your lights, make sure you're not parked in the middle of a road so that someone comes driving along and crashes into you, obviously. Safety is 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 important at night. Um, but I mean, oh, uh, I, and I almost forgot, uh, Oak Hammock Marsh is a very popular place, has become quite popular recently. Um, and uh, sometimes it gets a little bit busy, but it's a great spot as well. Uh, yeah, so all of those places I would say would be good. Um, yeah, Michelle, um, yeah, Michelle and I have observed out at the, the Folk Fest parking lot in Birds Hill. That's my favorite spot. Some of the beach parking lots can be good in Birds Hill as well because you're a little bit more surrounded by trees. And so when cars drive by, you don't get the headlights in your face. Um, but they tend to fill up fairly, fairly quickly as well. So we're going to try and do something in August or in September when restrictions allow us to have a, a reasonable group size together. I think right now the, the limit is 25 people and that's that's probably too small to, to host a public event, but we will do that and we'll also do some virtual stuff throughout August. So keep in touch. Of course, we'll be back on the air next week, Thursdays at seven. Next week, we will hopefully be telling you how the Nauka module of the International Space Station is perfectly fine and there's no problems and nothing to worry about and everything is fine. Yes, fine. Um, there was supposed to be 
another spacecraft to launch to the ISS, the, uh, the Boeing spacecraft that is, uh, that is scrubbed for now. Maybe by next week we'll know what's going on. So keep in touch. Get out there under the clear sky. Try and uh, avoid the smoke if you can. And uh, make sure that you stay safe. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining me. And uh, I hope you have clear skies.